We're back with another bonus conversation you only see here on CBS News New York. So in your district, there's a real big problem with cannabis shops, the illegal cannabis shops that are opening up. Are you satisfied with the efforts that the state has taken to try to shut them down? Well, we, we did a survey early on last year, uh, 63 from 54th Street to 108th. That's a lot of illegal cannabis shops. So at this point, um, the state has some efforts. The sheriff has some efforts, the district attorney has some efforts, and the corporation council has some efforts. But at this point, there are very few that have closed. Um, the state obviously recently passed a law. Before that, the sheriff, <laughs> the corporation council, and the district attorney were all trying. Um, the issue is very few have closed, as I indicated. So. I think the state needs to give more authority to the city. That's what it seems to be lacking. The state, you know, under, uh, you have the right, you're selling, you have illegal cigarettes, et cetera. Um, massive, you know, $25,000 a day fines. The city can't do that. The city can say, I went with the sheriff. Okay, this uh, weed is, you know, $25. This illegal cigarette is $50. You have to list it all. It takes hours. It took us whole day to close, try to close, we didn't, three shops. And then they opened the next day. Anyway. The next day they opened. You know why? Demand. Yes. So if the, well, the thing that I don't get is this, if there is this big demand, why don't they just give out these legal licenses, speed it up, so that this, at least the state is getting the tax income and it's not done under the counter? It's a state issue, and so my understanding is the first round, which is what we're in, has to go to those who are formerly criminal justice involved with marijuana. And so that's the state law. But now, it's taking an awfully long time. It, it's taking a long time. And my concern is actually the kids who are in the high schools who are going to these shops and are vaping. That's my real concern. And they're doing it before and after class. Correct. And it's really frightening because these kids already missed two years of school. You also have the issue, you know, you have, I, have, I met a nurse whose child has attention disorder. So she was in there, she thought it was legal. People it. think it's legal. So at the end, it's up to the state to decide how to handle this, but I will say, um, they should not be selling to underage. So I have two more questions. First of all, how do you feel about the fact about allowing the people who grow the cannabis products to sell them at green markets in your district? I mean, if it's, I, you know, people want to buy it and, and, you know, I don't have a problem with it. It's not something that I would purchase, but I think that if people want to sell it, um, the issue with the green markets and the farmers is that the farmers produce all this uh, cannabis and there's not enough sales in the legal shops. The illegal shops are buying from California. When we went in, everything was CA, 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 California. So you'd rather see it with, that you're selling New York products? I, well, I don't know that the illegal ones are going to buy from New York. I don't think they can. But what I'm saying is these farmers are in deep trouble because they, per they, they grew all this product and no place to sell it. So do you think that we're at a point now where um, something should be done about the people who are smoking on the street. I'm asking the question because I talk to people who work here and other places and they complain about either walking on the street and inhaling the smoke from marijuana or there are people who have it coming up through the radiators in their apartment buildings and they're smelling it in their apartments. Right. So is there something that should be done? Should there be a law to limit people from smoking in certain places? I get the same complaint. Um, I passed a law that said, when I was in the city council previously, that said no smoking allowed when Bloomberg was mayor in parks and in beaches. So that's the law. Um, so you can smoke on the street, but not in a park. Some people think you can. It's illegal. I mean, the same. I was. You walk on the street. You walk down the street. How many times do you smell marijuana? I, a lot. And so, but I, th what I'm saying is, I think we should put tobacco and marijuana in the same. Uh, bailiwick that if you're illegally smoking cigarettes on the street then you should be illegally smoking marijuana I will say buildings we should make it easier for buildings to have no smoking that would help with the person who's got it coming up through their because there are ducts. a lot of people that I have spoken to who have come up to me and said something should be done I it comes up into my apartment right I mean the other problem nicotine is not healthy 
I don't know enough about the medical aspects of marijuana. I do have friends who use it in the past, particularly if they had AIDS, because they felt it was a good medicine. So that's another whole topic. I don't think I'd consider cigarettes a medicine. So the question is, how do you handle the medical aspect? So let's change topics. Let's look at Rikers Island. The, a judge is supposed to consider the possibility in the next few weeks of appointing either a, an outside mon an outside receivership, somebody else to run the jails, or to hold the city in contempt. How do you come down on that in terms of how the city is handling Rikers, given the fact that you know the mayor's had only 18 months to deal with a problem that goes back many, many years? I, mean, I have great respect for Commissioner Molina. What I don't understand is, why is he not more transparent? In other words, the first thing that happened, I think, was the Board of Correction was told they couldn't get the information from the video cameras. Right. And then the uh, monitor was told that he couldn't find out except through some other means about who died when. Why are you being so secret about why can't we work together on solving these problems? I find this lack of transparency surprising and unfortunate. Uh, it, I, that's it, my, my most concern. I'm a big believer, as you know, in open government, I head up a committee that does investigations and oversight. Government has to be transparent. So have we reached a point where uh, somebody outside the city should run the jails, or is it just enough, not enough, but to hold the city in contempt and force them to be transparent? I, I would, I'm not 100% yet with the outside because I don't know if it would take another year for them to get caught up. I don't know how an outside person, federal government, works. Uh, I'm going to leave it up to Judge Swain, who's overseeing this case. But I will say this lack of transparency is really concerning. But you also have a situation where this is sort of short term anyway, because according to the law passed by the city council and signed by the previous mayor, the Rikers has to be closed by 2027, right. and four community jails have to be open. So, why? You know, why? What's the point? By the time the monitor, this is 2023, almost right. 2024. By the time the mon the outside person gets up to speed, we're almost closing the jails. Right. And but the issue also with closing the jails is why we have to work together. I was borough president. I supported the Euler closing uh, the jails and the Manhattan one, which is very controversial. The problem is we're at 6,000 people now. We have to get down to 3,300. Well, how are we going to do that? So that's the kind of question. I don't know if a federal monitor can do it any better, but the fact is we're not focused on that number. So basically what you're saying is that whoever runs the jails, be it the mayor you know, Commissioner Molina or some outside person, they're going to have to find a way to cut the population of Rikers basically in half, because there's over 6,000 people there now, which is going to mean putting people out on the street, which is not going to, uh, you know, please a lot of people. I think it's a terrible idea to put people out on the street, but I also think the only way to solve this is to work with your fortune societies, with your Osbournes, with your detractors, if you like, the Board of Correction. Everybody has to be in this game together. We're not. Is it realistic to say that you should reduce the population of Rutgers, which now has well over 6,000 people, to half in order to just close the jail? Well, otherwise you have to find other locations that are in the neighborhoods to be able to keep some of these people. I mean, we do have closed we're housing migrants now in the Lincoln facility. As an example, we have three facilities in the borough of Manhattan that could be available, as an example, that are in the neighborhoods that were used before. So what you're saying is you have to find more than four uh, community jails in order to uh, close Rutgers, and most of them are going to be in your borough. Well, I mean, I'm, there was never a complaint about Lincoln before, as an example, So, I, or, or maybe there were horrible facilities. They need to be renovated and fixed up. But what I'm saying is you need to have a discussion with more than the mayor, the commissioner. Nobody else is involved. Well, obviously, it could be handled through the monitor and through the federal courts. Right. So moving right along, we have a mayor who's been on a, what I would call a get-no-respect tour, um, who <laughs> has, you know, been complaining about the fact that um, he doesn't get credit for the things that he's done. How do you how do you come down on this? Well, you know, you, he and I were borough presidents together, and so we have a good relationship. Um, I would say that. You know, this is, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, maybe even longer than he has. You have to have very thick skin. 
and you know, I happen to love the press. That's my uh, bailiwick in terms of whom I like to work with in uh, public policy. But you know, you gotta. He, he works very hard. I don't always agree with his decision, but he works very hard. I never would, and that's I work hard, so I appreciate that. I know what that's like. Um, I think he should embrace the press. I think he should work with the press. Um, you know, I think he does get some respect because of how hard he works and how hard the decisions are to make in 2023. You talked about the migrants, but you could multiply that. You've got congestion pricing. You've got a lack of affordable housing. You've got very little support from outside entities. You know, the way you do this, again, I go back to you work, you bring everybody together at the table. How can we solve this together? And then everybody has ownership. It's a tough, he's in a tough bind. I think that part of the problem for him was I think he thought, I'm going to fix the NYPD and everything is going to be roses. He didn't realize that there were other problems in other agencies right. that he inherited. I think that's correct. But also NYPD is not easy in the terms of public safety. So another issue is the mayor is going after the sidewalk sheds, trying to find a way to take them down. Your thoughts on that? The person I respect most in government is Jimmy Otto. And he's now head of the buildings department. He is. And we were borough presidents together, along with the mayor. And if you could think of one person who could solve this, it is Honorable James Otto. A Republican, we should point out. That's fine with me. He's terrific. So he I have full co confidence. He's got some ideas. I call it the carrot and stick approach to sheds. And I think he'll figure it out. It's a good, it's a good proposal in the sense that give people a certain amount of leeway. If there's no work, then they're going to get fined. And then the stick would be for low, I mean, that's the stick. If there's a carrot, it would be, it's a low-income building. They don't have the money for the roof to be fixed. So another, we'll, we'll help them, is what he says. Another issue that I wanted to talk to you about, it has to do with climate change and the governor's uh, is deciding that she wants no more gas stoves. And I wonder what the effect that's going to be on you know public housing projects like NYCHA and whether that's actually doable. You know, I know it's a laudable goal to, you know, do things to help climate change, but is that realistic in New York City? Well, I mean, I don't, this is not my expertise. Um, I will say that um, I, over time, I grew up with an electric stove, and now I have a gas stove because I lived in my house for so many years. I mean, 30 years or something. That's what we had. That's what we used. I don't. I think that people should, if it's helpful in terms of fossil fuel, we should work on electric stoves. There was an article in the other, I know some uh, esteemed chefs are really concerned. Maybe you have some exemptions. I'm all for exemptions if they make sense, if this is the only way you can make excellent food. But for people like me, uh, electric is fine. Okay. Gail Brewer, <laughs> Councilwoman Gail Brewer, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you at home for joining us as well.